19. So, um, first of all, I'm living here in, in Switzerland. Um, I was driving up with my old uh, Vespa scooter today and was following uh, a big lorry truck. And um, actually, this was yellow and red, and there was a big sign DHL. So, I'm not working for DHL, but um, I will relieve a little bit later why it's yellow and red. So, um, for a short introduction, of course, I was basically um, writing these two books. And um, it was in 2018, and everyone attended the conference. Larry Leifer actually um, distributed 200 copies of the book. So we have the German version and the English version. And on page 240, if you not stopped reading on the third page you know, of the book, there was already one chapter about business ecosystem design. And um, over the last five years, um, I was doing a lot of research and running projects in the area of business ecosystem design. And um, it's, it's really now picking up in Europe. Um, when we look like in other countries, for example, China, um, also a couple of large players in the US, they have really figured out how to build up business ecosystem capital. I will explain a little bit later what it's all about. Uh, in Europe, we're lacking behind this kind of methodology and putting things together. But um, I show you later on how it works and what is a good model to combine uh, design thinking and system thinking. So as mentioned before, I'm an expert for uh, digital innovation, design thinking, of course, ecosystem design. Um, besides being an author, because you can't live from it, I have a day job as well. Um, I'm working here for Deloitte Switzerland, running the innovation labs. And um, we also use the labs for uh, new ecosystems and always in the combination with new technologies. So um, basically all these business ecosystems are enabled by new technologies. So one is really big data analytics. We have seen over the last five years that blockchain is coming in, a distributed ledger technology to build up decentralized ecosystems. Uh, we know the hype is a little bit over now and we realize that all of these proof of concepts are working as expected, but um, there's still a couple of companies out there realizing blockchain solutions. And in the end of the day, it's not really the technology, it's more about designing the ecosystem because in the end of the day, you have like um, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer interaction, you have new value streams and you need to generate kind of revenue streams within the system to make it sustainable. And uh, this is one reason why blockchain technology will also enable and help to build up these um, business ecosystems. Um, I'm really happy to connect with me. If you have any further questions over LinkedIn, you can write me questions afterwards. I know there will be a couple of Q&A uh, time afterwards, but if you have any questions about the topic, please reach out and connect. So um, let's start while we talk about business ecosystems. And um, when I look back a little bit for the last eight months, you know, I realized that we have like a really kind of accelerator in the digital transformation. And um, when we look at, in our own behavior, we have kind of a new customer behavior. We have kind of new customer needs, you know, and uh, basically things have changed a little bit. So I think it starts with, with everything. So how you shop food, how you get your clothes, um, how you order maybe um, your next um, ride, everything. So um, basically through COVID-19, you know, we have kind of a change how um, all of us interact with, with companies. And it starts with banking, starts how we interact with our insurance companies. So many aspects. So one more time, you know, new customer needs are a driver for um, new ecosystems. On the other hand, as mentioned before, new technologies. And um, on the other hand, we have kind of new digital business models. And all these things come together at the moment that we can realize these kind of new business ecosystems. So um, that's the only definition I have, but I think it's quite important what we're talking about. Um, so business ecosystem design is like realizing unique value propositions. And uh, this is not realized by one actor, it's usually realized by three, four, five, or 200 actors in the system. And all of them contribute with their capabilities, with technology to provide really a unique experience. And um, the really successful companies, they're trying to disappear from the market. So when we looked into the financial service industry, for example, there's one company called DBS Bank Singapore. 
And the DBS Bank Singapore has a nice vision statement. So I like to be invisible for all the clients. A bank to be invisible for all the clients. But just look into all the banks in Switzerland. So trying to keep the customer interaction, you know, being present at the client. And we see companies in Asia that like to be invisible for the for the client. You know, what's what they gonna do? They look into kind of new value propositions. So for example, they look into the entire life cycle of a client. You know, they basically um, you're born, you go to school, you need findings for the university, first family, you buy a home many, many things over your lifetime. And at the end of the day, you don't like to bother with your financial products. You like to have it convenient, right? So um, if you're now, what are 45 years old, and you like to be retired with 60, you know, you don't like to care, you know, your job to be done is basically to retire with 60 and everything else could be organized by any kind of ecosystem approach. So a lot of companies behind helping you to fulfill your dreams and needs and this usually is then um, operated and provided by many companies. So um, there are a couple of words into this definition. And uh, first of all, design, you know, and design is like application of a design mindset. And this really means um, you work in iterations, you work in experiments, you put the customer first before you're designing any kind of new system or ecosystem. On the other hand, we have like various states of mind. So this is actually the idea of combining design thinking and system thinking in one approach to come up with like um, systems were a little bit better than everyone else. And of course, it's kind of the unknown market opportunity. So um, in our understanding of creating ecosystems, sometimes people tend to um, the idea of partner management. So um, back to the example of insurance companies and um, banks. So we have insurance products and we look into partners to sell these insurance products to more customers. But this is something we already know for 200 years, you know, it's partner management, it's kind of your expansion of your value chain with different partners to bring the service to the market. With the ecosystem design approach, you know, you first look into the customer needs and maybe, you know, you bring in capabilities, maybe you bring in your products, but at the end of the day, it's really counting to fulfill the new customer needs with your value proposition. And the final ones, like really the ambition for black ocean strategy. So most of us, we know the blue ocean, red ocean. I think that's a familiar concept of the last 20 years. But the black ocean said, you create a system, no one else is able to compete. And we're saying, well, no one likes to compete or no one is able to compete. That sounds not right. Uh, we have a lot of these systems already in, in place, you know. Um, I don't know how many of you use a Siemens mobile phone or a Nokia no mobile phone. Uh, basically no one because they're for the app market, you know, and all the applications you use, there are two systems out, it's Apple and Android. So both companies already created kind of black ocean strategies because there's no competition. And we see this now in many other markets that we have like really big players combining the capabilities of different actors and unique value propositions and no one's able to compete. Okay, so that's so far for the definition. When I look a little bit on the time perspective, and it's kind of my personal model where I put everything together. So in the 80s, you had like design thinking, new business models, all, all these things. And later on, um, from 2000 onwards, at least for me, it was the combination about design thinking and system thinking and creating like platforms. And if you look at the platform economy, it was risen out of the internet. And there are a lot of players, you know, they have centralized systems, you know, they define the rules. You can participate on a marketplace and you get like this kind of platform economy. So this was also for the last 20 years. What we see at the moment is a transformation out of this platform economy into something called kind of ecosystem economy. And you probably will say oh, it's the same thing, but I will explain you later, it's a little bit different because it's really about cross industry, new value streams, and it's really about applying these new digital business models. So at the end of the day, you know, this kind of new way of thinking in the business ecosystem context, you're building kind of really unique solutions with a new mindset. I'll explain a little bit these mind shifts um, on, on a couple of slides. Of course, you use the fitting actors within the system to provide the value proposition. You have new and lasting value streams. You look into the new business models, and of course, 
you participating as a company in new market rules. And this has like two dimensions. First of all, is the strategy part. On the other hand, like the technology you have to use to um, be part of the entire ecosystem play. So there might be different kind of ways of thinking about ecosystems. So usually um, what I heard many times, innovation ecosystems. This is also something we, we see um, for a long time. You go to um, the Silicon Valley, you go to Tel Aviv, you go in other clusters, and you have companies, you know, specific working on one topic. So when you go to Tel, Tel Aviv, you know, it's all about security, and there's a cluster of innovation happening with, with different actors. And that's, of course, like this transaction data ecosystem. Um, data ecosystem, also kind of part of the ecosystem design um, approach, but, you know, you have also these kind of, of approaches to see, you know, there's transaction behind, you know, and these transactions are combined by different actors and maybe companies exchange data to create new products and solutions. And finally, there's kinds of this knowledge and information ecosystem. So these are kind of different ways and um, views on ecosystem and actually all these things are incorporated into the ecosystem design methodology. So when I talk about business ecosystem, of course, um, there's really the kind of stable companies here on the left side. These are the integrated companies. And most companies operate this kind of inter integrated way, you know, because you have like kind of value chains, you know, and this is a concept we started in the industrial revolution. And for many companies, this kind of business model and behavior is good, you know. It's like kind of when you go back in the nature, you have islands out there, you know, islands, there are birds and they can't fly. And what's the reason why they can't fly? Because there's no one eating them, because there's no kind of um, fear that some other animal is basically taking over. And if you don't have to fly away, you, you stop flying. And for a lot of integrated companies, the same thing counts. For them, business ecosystems will be not a big issue. On the other hand, we have like kind of these open capital market economies. And these are really open markets, you know, everything is free. Uh, probably don't have this right now as, as an example, but you know, this is kind of, there's no rules, there's no intervention from the government. And between, we have like these new ecosystems. And they have a couple of rules, but they're not centralized, they're more decentralized. On the other hand, they're trying to generate more value than everyone else. So I'll give you two examples about how you're gonna design ecosystem in a, in a good way, and examples from my own experience um, who did not work so well. And I start with this one because I was also working for Swisscom for a long time. Um, I don't know who heard about Swisscom IO. One, two, or three. Well, three people have heard about it. Great. Um, Swisscom IO was um, developed approximately 10 years ago. And the idea was to build something uh, like what we know nowadays as WeChat or WhatsApp. Who's using WhatsApp? Everyone, perfect. So, what happened? You know, um, Swisscom, telecommunication provider, invested approximately 15 million francs to develop a solution similar to WhatsApp. So the first thing you do, and kind of this old mindset, um, we not launch it to the market because we have like this big stack of SMS revenues, you know? So no one likes really to dis disrupt their own business model. So what you're gonna do, you put it in kind of your last corner of your, of your desk, you know, and you wait until the next year and you wait another year. And then you realize there's like a small company coming from the US called WhatsApp. And in no time, everyone was connected over WhatsApp. Also for me, it was like I learned about it on a conference in Munich. And three months later, I was basically connected to half of Europe uh, via WhatsApp. So what do you do as a traditional company having this great invention? You launch it in the market immediately. And because you are a traditional company, you uh, say it's just for Swisscom customers. So you limit it to the customers in Switzerland who have already a telephone number from, from, from your operator. And the next thing you do, because you realize no one is using it, what do you do? Marketing, right? Marketing is a success story. So in this case, uh, basically, you hire Tina Turner for a couple of millions. You know, Tina Turner then 
um, going on the lake and um, with a kind of small boat and announcing I'm connected to the world, I'm using IO, and you're trying to build up a new solution just for the Swiss market. So, of course, it was not successful. And um, asking back, what do you think, how many transactions per year per customer have been on average on IO? Yearly basis, how many transactions? Exactly, two transactions. You know, the average amount of transaction was two. I probably have already in the last quarter of an hour, 50 messages on WhatsApp. So, um, but what was the problem, you know? First of all, you're limited to your own customer base. Second of all, you haven't thought about the entire community. And third of all, you have not realized that communication is a global kind of idea, and that's something just happening in Switzerland with your, with your closest family. The next thing was, you know, they got like two inquiries from large telco operators in, in Europe asking for a white label solution of um, IO. So what do you do as a traditional company? Of course not, you know, we're not sharing this kind of idea with other operators in Europe because it's kind of limited to Switzerland just for our clients. So everything related to like network effects, you know, and spreading kind of a solution on a broader kind of customer base to be successful, also to realize exponential growth was not, was not able to realize. So uh, finally, that's the last thing about this use case. As a traditional company, what do you do? You're not successful in the B2C market. You launch it for the B2B market. I don't have to explain what was the outcome, you know. So now we come to like the, the next example is WeChat, you know, and I don't know if you heard about the WeChat example. It's also something we put into the book in the first chapter, page 240 onwards from the playbook, um, how WeChat actually was so successful and doing exactly the same what, what Swisscom was, was able to do. They started with the same thing. They started kind of as a messenger in the beginning. They know you can transact information, but then they realized, you know, there's a concept behind, a concept between system thinking and design thinking. And what they created was minimum viable ecosystems. And the idea of minimum viable ecosystems really is that you look into the customer needs, you realize something with the smallest amount of possible actors, being really efficient and testing your ecosystem. And if it's successful, you roll it out to the, to the broader, broader market. So one example about a nice service from WeChat is about uh, taxi services. So I don't know if you have been in Shanghai uh, 10, 15 years ago. Shanghai 15 years ago, there was no subway. So you were hanging around with your arm on the street for like two hours on a rainy day, you know, finding a taxi. So um, by using design thinking, you know, so find out, you know, this is a customer need, you know, I like to get a taxi on a rainy day in Shanghai. So uh, WeChat was saying, okay, let's, let's collect all these customer needs, but then we need kind of ecosystem. And what are the eco ecosystem players in this play? Of course, taxi driver, right? So, um, but the taxi driver itself would say, why should I join this ecosystem? Why should I be part of WeChat just to get a client? I have client anyways, right? Because on a rainy day, I'm busy. So I don't have to look for like more business that I actually can handle. So they were going back to the taxi drivers, again, applying design thinking to find out about the customer needs. And they realized uh, the taxi driver is coming home after a full day of work. And the first thing he does, what is it? Giving the money to the wife. Oh. The Chinese concept. And um, basically, you know, there was, realizing this might be kind of a pain and what is a good solution to incentivize the taxi driver to be part of it. So they integrated Bitcoin wallets into the application so that the taxi driver can get the fares from the taxi taxi drive into the, into the wallet. So in the end of the day, the taxi driver came home saying, wow, it was a really bad day, you know, and actually only half of the revenues today gave the feared money to the wife and the rest was fun because, you know, there's gambling, you know, there was kind of this, this um, massive amount of value increase in Bitcoin. And a lot of taxi drivers actually thought that's a cool idea, you know, actually joining this kind of ecosystem to be part of it. So what I'm saying is, you know, you have to look into new customer needs. That's the first thing. You have to look also into the needs of all the actors in the system. And then you have to have benefits, you know, that they join into the system. This is kind of the simplest 
kind of way of explaining it. Now you can imagine looking into entire value chains for like uh, healthcare, for example, e-prescription. You can look into entire chains for like financial products. You can look into insurance products and many more, you know. And so the idea is really, you know, how can I attract like different parties to create a, a really new value proposition? And most of them are really digital. So, um, of course, it could be like kind of a digital ecosystem. And so WeChat example is a, is a good example about uh, what can happen in, in, a, in a digital world. So the next thing about this is just related to COVID-19, because I think this case is also quite, quite nice to observe. Um, we're still struggling a little bit in Europe about all these apps related to COVID-19, right? So there's an app in Switzerland, one in Germany, I don't know, maybe one in the Netherlands. And the idea is really everyone is staying in the borders of the country and no one's moving, right? And the app works for our country. I don't understand the system because what WeChat did, you know, within COVID-19, they used the QR economy. And the QR economy is like all these kind of QR codes, you know, and you go and tag with your smartphone and easily it's located um, back to where you are at the moment, what is the situation, who else is surrounded. And what, what they did, they had a couple of 100,000 downloads, you know, of this COVID-19 related application to, to WeChat and they tracked like in no time all these cases, you know. So while Europe was creating a own application, you know, trying to get the downloads. They were just building on an existing ecosystem with a lot of people already active and uh, looking into the, the cases and the, the tracking of, of COVID-19. So maybe that's one of the reasons why China is a little bit ahead of the curve with COVID-19 and Europe, we are still um, looking into how to operate and how to get it solved. Um, the other thing is, of course, you will probably argue, you know, there's also data and GDPR and all these other things. Now it's a big topic, yeah, where we have to talk about these things, but it's also not something bad, you know, because we have the rules in Europe to know how to handle this data. And with good rules, you can also find good ways to find solutions. So I think it's not really kind of the, the hurdle and the argument that you cannot have kind of the same approach within, within Europe. Just kind of excourse to the COVID-19 world and, and WeChat. So new paradigm. Um, yeah, this is my, my favorite picture at the moment. Um, it's kind of this kind of old world, you know, like you're, you're in the egg, you know, and you're coming out of the egg as a totally new world. You know, this is kind of the, the methodology I use for, for ecosystem design. And when we look into, into Europe, it's looked like this, you know, we have this fat, big companies, you know, sitting on like, lot of capabilities, products, and customer needs, and we're not really moving, you know. And um, what I like to do, I like to build a little bit of awareness, you know, that's a lot of potential in collaborating with other companies and creating these ecosystems. And at the end of the day, you know, we don't have these kind of big fat companies anymore, but we have kind of this paradigm shift. And um, I put together like 10 mind shifts, you know, how to go into like this ecosystem play. And the first thing is, you know, this might be obvious because I'm into this design thinking world, is going out from like this company view, product view, into like a more customer centric view. And you will probably say that's master of the obvious, that's what you should always do. Um, probably nine out of 10 companies I speak about ecosystem design, they put their own company in the center of the ecosystem. So nine out of 10 companies put themselves in the center of the ecosystem. So they design, you know, this is our company, our products, our values, and then the old kind of way of thinking with partners, they look into all the actors around, and there's a little tiny kind of dot somewhere, and this is a customer. And the first thing I do, you know, is I, you know, first put the customer in the center of your ecosystem because the customer's interacting with many, many stakeholders and companies, and then start to design your ecosystem. And they come later, why it's so important. Sec next thing, you know, the next thing from linear to like um, iterative is also kind of not a new thing. But again, you know, if you're not doing a lot of iteration, testing your system and on both sides, building your MVP, but also your MVE, your minimum viable ecosystem, it needs testing, it needs validation. And if the actors are not fitting within your ecosystem, you have to replace them or find new ways to operate. New technology sometimes help, like distributed ledger technology or blockchain to solve the problem. So this is also quite, quite 
important part because usually if you go into large companies, they're still in the old way of operating in the strategic modus, uh, defining strategy. So you analyze, you analyze what is the competitor doing, you analyze how much sell we do we sell to our clients with our current product and you do kind of this market screening you know and while analyzing all these things you're not looking into these new value proposition or maybe also the concept of co-competition so it's nothing wrong having like two three companies of the same kind of industry on the same platform and trying to combine things in a new value proposition and sometimes you know it's just the uh, flow of data coming back, giving you the advantage. So nowadays you look into like big data analytics to define your products, to have like a unique experience with like a mass customization of, of, of different people. So the idea is really, you know, look into how you combine and how you can use the data to make new products and not focusing on the current situation in the market and the current industry. The next mind shift is really from silos into co-evolution. And co-evolution is also a concept, you know, we always talk about it maybe, but we never realize it. And a good example about co-evolution is um, Apple and Goldman Sachs. Do you know the case about Apple and Goldman Sachs? Yeah, cool. So what, what happened, you know, as Goldman Sachs is a kind of a private investment powerhouse on the Wall Street, you know, and they're really famous and have a good name, name you know, in, in, the, in the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street uh, environment. And of course, you know Apple because technology company. So what they started to do, they um, were saying, you know, was a lifestyle technology approach from Apple and Goldman Sachs as a good bank with a good reputation, why not entering the credit card business? And you would say probably Goldman Sachs has nothing to do with credit cards. You know, they have no single revenue streams on the credit card business, but they have a good name in, in the business. And co-evolution is, you know, that Goldman Sachs is building up digital capabilities for banks. So they create like Marcus Bank and they create like kind of ideas in the uh, cr credit, um, credit market. And on the other hand, Apple, you know, say, you know, this is kind of a, good way, you know, to engage with our clients because if we have the credit card data, we can make a lot of data analytics and knowing more about the behavior of the clients and building better products. So this is kind of the shift about from these silos we are operating in the past into co-evolution and the Apple Goldman Sachs uh, example really shows how this might work. So uh, next one's really from elements to unique value proposition. And I mentioned before, you know, it's not like what you have sold um, in, the, in the past, um, back to the example about insurance companies, you know, who's really like motivated and excited about looking into the policies from your insurance company? You are, Sean, great. You, you have a lot of time, you're a professor, you know, that's probably the reason. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, we like to, we like to be like risk-free, you know, so the idea is, um, we like to have it covered. We don't understand usually what's written in the con contracts. So if you go to your bank and they offer you any kind of products, the so usually behavior is, you know, we have like the 30 pages of like RGBs and contracts and everything related. And we always say we did understand everything. We tend to say we, we understand everything they offer to us, you know, because it's kind of, we don't like to get embarrassed that we don't understand like the saving plan for the daughter. So usually when the bank clerk is sitting next to us, we say, you know, we understand everything. But in the end of the day, we like to have it like seamless and we like to have dreams in our lives. So this comes again to these life events, you know. So if you like to retire with 60, you know, I like to get kind of the idea how, how to, to get it done and not buying a financial product. It's more like, you know, uh, what is like the things I have to do to fulfill my dreams. And this is really where the whole idea comes into these unique and bigger value propositions so that we really look what's behind, you know, and how different actors can help you to get into this kind of new um, approach of, of selling it. So the next one, five, is really from disconnection to networking. And um, again, network effects. So the example of Swisscom, you know, taught us already, you know, if you don't, don't realize that the kind of a bigger scope of, of, of people you can get involved and um, also looking into how they can help you to grow your business, it it's might be quite hard to realize. And the basic idea about ecosystems design to realize these network effects and to build business models. And um, 
I call like the multidimensional view of business models to create more value for the, the entire system. So as a single actor, you know, you have value, but with the network effects of multi-actors in the system, you can create more value. So this is the basic idea behind. And then of course, from isolation to like value streams and for the value stream part, it's really the approach where I use system thinking because you have to see that everyone has a benefit in the system and you have to find ways that it's transparent for all the actors involved. You know, it's not like the old model, you know, we build a platform, you know, we don't say anything how we generate revenues. It's more like you share how the revenues are generated in the system and um, you're trying to design a system who can realize exponential growth and everyone has like a win situation in the system. So for the number eight, it's like from one business model to the multi-dimensional view of business models. And this is actually quite important. If you initiate an ecosystem, you don't just have to think about your own business model as a platform or like an ecosystem. You also think about all the business or potential business model of the actors involved in the system. And I'll give you an example which company does it really nicely in the B2B market is Amazon. So if you are um, buying cloud service from Amazon, you know, they present you five business models, how it generate money. So you don't have to think as your own operator about, you know, buying Amazon cloud services and then basically I'm reselling cloud services. They offer you five business models. And if you visit Amazon in Seattle, you know, they, they tell you, you're investing 100,000 francs and you get like 500,000 francs out, you know because they already looked into the potential business model, you can generate money. And this is also something we don't do, you know, in every company I talk to, um, they're struggling defining their own business model. And if I tell them you should in invent and create all the business models of everyone else, they're saying we can't, you know, because it's complex. Again, you know, you have to think about what is really the idea of generating money for all these players. And if you're attractive, you know, and you find ways, like the taxi driver in Shanghai, you know, gambling with Bitcoin and later on buying with the Bitcoin, like the booth in the shop, you know, and all these things. Same thing you can apply like for, for large operations and companies. So number nine, I mentioned already red to black ocean. So you build a system, no one can compete. And of course, this is really important. We had this many times in many presentations today. It's the mindset, it's the culture, how we interact with the other players. So a lot of companies is this command and control, right? And the platform economy is all about command and control. But in an ecosystem approach, you initiate and you do the or orchestration. And the orchestration is kind of a different way of, of organizing and putting up the governance models of a company because then you put some rules into place, but you also give kind of the power and the potential of innovation to all the actors in the system. So they come back with new ideas. They come back with new interactions uh, with, with your clients and bring it back to the ecosystem. So you probably will realize a lot of these things are based on, on kind of things we see in nature, you know, kind of the idea of co-evolution, -ev the kind of the idea of bringing two things together and work together, like the whale and the house on top, or maybe you realize also that ecosystems are always kind of in an agile environment and moving. So with the global warming, of course, the bigger fish has a little bit of a problem. So for smaller fish can apply easily to the new conditions. So all those things are kind of related to the, to the idea of nature. The only difference about nature and business ecosystem design and business ecosystem design, you can really design. You in the driver's seat, you know, you basically can design the system and make it happen, you know, and all these actors out there that not to force into your system, but if you have benefits, you know, it's easy to convince them, say, you know, you can join into my business ecosystem. You have these benefits, these kind of business model you can realize and make it happen on, on a later stage. So problem to growth and scale frameworks this is uh, actually a framework we presented in the design thinking playbooks was really looking into design thinking, research, co-creation, lean startup, business ecosystem design and scale. And um, basically this comes a little bit on, on the later stage. So usually when I start these projects, you know, I really go back to the customer needs, I'm building 
various MVPs. It's not just one MVP, it's usually 10, 15, 20 MVPs, you know, coming together in a bigger value proposition. And then we start like with the minimum value ecosystem. So we're creating out of two, three minimum value products, a system onboarding the actors, you know, bring the value to the system and we're testing in a small scale the ecosystem with the client. And if this works, you know, we immediately go into kind of a scale, scale up phase to, to, to run the entire uh, operations. So basically the focus really on business ecosystem design. And again, you know, this is kind of the simple, simplified version of it. Um, design thinking gives you the final product, uh, prototype, you get into lean startup, you get your MVP, Ecosystem provides your minimum value ecosystem and for scale, you look into like the ambition to have a black ocean strategy that no one can compete with you. Of course, you cannot always realize these things, you know, and it's always easy to say, you know, you can be the next Amazon, the next Tencent, but these ecosystems also work kind of a local or like a national level or even in a, a region like Europe in comparison to the US and, and Asia. So it's always kind of worth thinking about what is unique in my environment, what kind of capabilities and other actors out there, you know, to create a similar system. And what we see at the moment, there are a lot of insurance companies, banks out there um, trying to realize ecosystems even for regions. So you have like cantonal banks, for example, looking into the Zurich area to create something. You have insurance companies are looking for Europe and there's many kind of other things uh, we can observe in the markets, a company really trying to go into this kind of ecosystem play. So at the end of the day, you know, it really comes to like desirability, viability, and feasibility for design thinking and the lean startup methodology is changing a little bit later on when you look into the ecosystem design, because um, I was saying it's a little bit kind of the adaptability and this kind of adapts the system. We had this already in many, many keynotes and presentations today, you know, you have to adapt in these kind of dynamic systems all the time. So it's not kind of a, a stable kind of situation. There will be always actors coming in. There will be always kind of new customer needs. There will be also kind of a shift in the value streams. So this is really dynamic. And for the ecosystem, you have to adapt all the time. And the same, same kind of respect, uh, we have to look into the value enhanceability. And the value enhanceability comes really to the network effects. And um, value is generated to many dots, you know, and a new, new, new and unique value proposition. When it comes to scale, um, this kind of the idea of captive, you know, you have to um, find the anchor with, with, your, with your customer. As a good ecosystem out there, you know, they interact with the client every minute, every hour, every day, you know. It's nothing you do like once in a lifetime of, of, of a customer. You're trying to find really ways to engage them all the time, you know. And we have seen these concepts from the platform economy. So for example, Facebook, you know, you feel lo lo lonely somehow, you know, you go to Facebook, you have the need to communicate, you go to, to WhatsApp and many other things. So we're trying to apply the same kind of idea, you know, to um, engage with customers and um, set a couple of anchors, you know, to be really close. And of course, if you're close to your clients, there's a lot of interactions, you have to build up your IT infrastructure to scale with the system, you know, because you like to collect the data, you like to, um, do a couple of uh, analytics to run new products. And finally, um, you're trying to grow and extend all your value proposition over time. And again, we have seen the example about uh, WeChat, you know, they really extended from a messenger to like a platform you can organize your entire life nowadays. You know, you can have like a credit there, you can do doctor appointments, you can order a taxi, you can do many things. So um, where does it come in when I look into where to play and how to win? So usually business ecosystems are more on the right side. You know, you explore like really new kind of value propositions and you look into like market opportunities you have not realized. Of course, everything here on the left side helps you to bring in these capabilities within an ecosystem or to start one. Uh, what does not work is just using your own capabilities and driving uh, any kind of ecosystem. This is not, not going to happen, you know, it's just using your old business model and trying to um, uh, look into the market and like to sell more. Usually these things are just kind of a linear kind of uh, growth strategy and you will not um, realize any exponential growth. So why saying this, you know, if, if I just look into like this kind of 
capital classes, you know, and we know them for a long time. We have physical capital, financial capital, human capital, intellectual capital, and I call it ecosystem capital. An ecosystem capital is really the relationship between all these companies, it's the value streams and the proper design of the ecosystem to realize kind of a black ocean strategy. And if I just look into companies like banks, you know, ecosystem capital, zero, right? Automotive industry, ecosystem capital is starting a little bit. We see that the joint venture between BMW and Daimler, they um, had a platform for mobility, for example, you know, with a lot of startups. They're starting a little bit to get like ecosystem cap capital. Uh, telecommunication, of course, they had kind of this idea of being, being in a network, being an operator, connecting. Um, insurance, same like banking, you know. As all these traditional companies have almost no ecosystem capital. And it's possible to do so. So, for example, the company outside also in China, Ping'an. Ping'an is a was 10 years ago a traditional insurance company with the same profile like here on the, uh, on the left. And nowadays they have approximately 20 to 25% of ecosystem capital. And this company has 30,000 software developers, you know. So this is not kind of, you know, you have like these underwriters sitting in your company, they creating digital solutions and they creating like totally new ecosystem for health. So they have like doctor, hospitals, they have many other things, you know. And basically for the patient as a journey, you know, they get um, kind of health check on, on the subway. You go in a little bit kind of telephone booth, you know, and you get your interaction with the doctor and they're saying, you know, you have fever, go home, yeah, or get, get a pill. You get automatically in this kind of uh, interaction, digital, digital interaction, you get kind of your, your medicine on the spot, you know, while you go. And basically with this kind of systems, they have a totally different way of engaging with the customer. They have more data. And at the end of the day, it's really the convenience for the, for the patient, you know, to be part of this ecosystem and choosing kind of Ping Nan uh, instead of any kind of other um, insurance company. So what I'm saying, you know, if you like, really like to be successful in this ecosystem play, you should aim for kind of a distributed, well-distributed uh, part of all these capital streams. And um, I really have to emphasize that ecosystem capital and intellectual capital is quite important, you know, to, to be um, successful in this race. And um, also when we look into like the top 50 um, companies listed on the stock exchange in the US, Europe, and Asia, from the top 50 companies in Europe, there's probably one with a little bit of ecosystem capital, maybe two. You know, when we look into like the US, we have always already kind of 30% 30 30 of the companies. And in Asia, it's the same as between 25 and 30% uh, pre of the companies um, having ecosystem capital. And in Asia, um, these are really the big players. So there's Tencent, Alibaba, you, you name like these big brands who are really focusing on um, generating this kind of, of, of ecosystem. So um, what's the formula to succeed? And actually the two um, big parts. First of all, it's like really what I mentioned before, is a multi-dimensional view and development of these business models. So if you look into the business model of the ecosystem, okay, you know, we're able to do it, but also how all the other actors can generate money. And the second part is, you know, this is a traditional way, you know, we have a value proposition, we have a product, we try to use other actors to distribute, to help us in sales, and of course we can increase our market space. The ecosystem perspective, you start designing first the ecosystem with a unique value proposition. Then you look into how you can bring in your own capabilities. And then basically you use the approach from the top, you know, with a multi-dimensional view of the, um, the business models to scale. And this is basically what all these companies do, you know, we're so successful at, at the moment. They go like really on the right side to build like Black Ocean strategies. So again, Black Ocean, you know, you're impossible to compete. And this could, should be like really the ambition if you, you start any kind of ecosystem play. So um, the topic actually was bridging the gap between the product market fit and system actors fit. You know, this is actually what I should talk about. So let's, let's talk about these a little bit. And it's coming in here quite late, you know. So you're creating like a minimum value ecosystem and you look what kind of actors are, are fitting in. And 
what do you do? You create this minimal ecosystem. Yeah? And this really helps them to validate all these value streams. You see how everything works together. And um, the model behind, you know, it's also something you probably have seen in the first keynote today from Michael as well, uh, because we go also in, into loops. You know, we, we start with the, in the ecosystem design with, uh, with the customer needs. We look into the core value proposition for the entire uh, system. We describe all the actors which possibly can interact with the system. We classify them on, uh, on an ecosystem map. We look into the value streams and we look into the benefits for each actor. If you can't find benefits, you know, the system is already kind of die here in the early stage when you just build it up in, in, in your mind, you know, in, in designing it. And then of course you do kind of a loop of redesigning it. And sometimes I do this loop with clients five, six, 10 times, you know, to come up with the first idea of a system and saying, you know, these player might have benefits, these player might have all these um, potential to be part of it. And then of course I'm designing the business model of each actor in this kind of multi-dimensional view. And this is kind of our own stream, you know, finding out all these things. And then basically we come into the realization, looking into what are really the, the benefits, also kind of a co-creation approach, inviting the actors to the table and discuss with them. And finally you build your minimum value product to go into the next step. And then of course it's a little bit more like design and, and, and painting something than um, technology behind and, and this is how it looks like. So if, if I really do this with clients and now we started also kind of uh, university programs about business ecosystem design, we, we look into these systems, you know, and we, shall, we look into how these things are connected. We build something, we, we, we look how the MVPs comes together, we inviting like other actors, you know, to find out how it might work. And finally, you go over all these loops to uh, create a uh, unique and hopefully a system which aiming for a black ocean strategy. So key learnings, looking at the time, um, it's fine. Um, the five things you, you might like to remember, first of all, is ecosystem awareness. You know, that's kind of a new things happening out there. And um, it's not that you have to initiate your own ecosystem, but as a company, you should be part of one, you know? So sometimes, you know, there are new ecosystems coming along and you have capabilities, technology, customer interaction, data, and you should really look out and see if you can be part of any kind of ecosystem because there will be kind of a, a shift in transformation. Then of course, understanding kind of the, the options you have and the minimum viable ecosystem approach helps with low budgets, you know, to test something. Of course, managing the ecosystem and um, you probably know better than I do because all of you are expert in, in, in system thinking. You know, it's not just um, the ability to work with the systems or the ability to work on the system. And of course, um, the idea really to have a system with like value streams helping and, and network effects helping to grow the whole uh, idea behind the ecosystem. And finally, of course, leadership, you know, ecosystem leadership is putting together the right governance, giving the freedom to all the other actors to generate like all the innovation within the system. So, and finally, you know, if you do everything right, you know, there's a potential for Black Ocean play in this domain. So, in the end of the day, what you have to remember from this kind of speech, besides that there's taxi drivers out there and it's not DHL, it's we are right now in a transformation from uh, the platform economy into like an ecosystem economy. And if you observe Amazon and all these players, you know, they are looking into more like these ecosystems approaches. If you look into um, large insurance companies, they think about how to collaborate cross industry. Um, if you look into um, like car manufacturers, you realize they're stepping out of the idea, producing cars, they're looking into like kind of overall kind of unique value proposition to provide your mobility. And all these things are in the beginning in Europe, we see a lot of things happening or happened already in Asia and also uh, in the US, you have kind of this tendency uh, going from the platform economy into ecosystem design. So this is my last kind of words for this presentation. I think um, white's yellow. Now, uh, of course, I was writing a new book. It's out in December. It's about ecosystem design. We always start with publishing first the German version. So it will be out in December 2020. 320 pages about ecosystem design, all the methods and tools provided. The English version will be out in spring 
next year, hopefully, depending a little bit on COVID-19 and if we find like a publishing house again um, operating with us and co-creating co with us on this effort. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Michael, thank you for this very interesting and entertaining presentation. I'm pretty sure there are questions in the room and we have time to take two or three. Thanks for that presentation. I'm Martin from the Soul Systems. And what I would like to know is with the ecosystem getting more complex and also the systems that are the products or services getting more complex, communication between the stakeholders getting more and more problem. What we have seen in the last decades was within an enterprise getting communication and the digital threat established is one thing. But in an ecosystem with all the different tool chains and different also languages and behavior and terminologies and so on, it's getting even more complicated. Have you got any aspects of where is the world leading towards in this ecosystem co-development and co-engineering to get a, say, a common platform of dealing on complex business cases together, so a marketplace for co-engineering or something like that? Any thoughts about that? Perfect. You know, I think this is needed. You know, this is probably one of the biggest requirements we should develop. And um, as an um, initiator of an ecosystem, usually what's happening, you set a little bit kind of the governance structure, you set the rules, you know, and you can tell people, you know, what is the best way um, to have like kind of a standard. And um, that's also the next problem about culture. Um, I've seen in Europe many kind of ecosystem ideas, you know, and they have, probably has taken them two, two and a half years to sign the NDA between two or three parties, you know, to start the first MVE or to collaborate. And I think, you know, we sometimes we over-engineer a little bit kind of the framework, how we work together. In China, sometimes kind of, you know, the handshake and they start doing it and they do experiments. And on the way, they define the language, how to communicate. And I think here in Europe, we tend to um, define everything up front, you know, and later on, we are um, losing track because the time's passing by, you know, and no one has money anymore to put it forward. Just what, what I think, you know, what, what's happening. I've seen another hand up, yeah. So great. great talk, thanks a lot. Um, Regarding the, the Black Ocean strategy, you gave three examples, WeChat and then the, uh, the Google Apple one. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, all of these are based on one technological platform, which is then the basis for these, which also solves some of the communication issues. Do you also have an example of a Black Ocean ecosystem which does not have a single, a single uh, technological platform which is underlying the whole structure? Well, actually, now with the whole idea about blockchain, you know, we have seen a lot of ideas. We have a lot of... I was just saying a lot of ideas, you're moving in this direction. Um, if you look into Bitcoin, you know, and this might be like the simplest explanation of a decentralized system with a couple of rules, how you do the mining, how the whole process works, and it's decentralized, you know. And so somehow, you know, it's, it's working together as an ecosystem and it's generating value, you know, it's generating a lot of value. Now you can argue with a lot of things, you know, there's nothing behind, of course, but actually at the moment, now it's generating value with kind of this distributed kind of idea and couple of rules someone set in the beginning and everyone else is just operating freely in this kind of rules and system. If you're not aligned to the rules, you're out of the system, right? If you're aligned with the rules, you're part of it. So this is... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think really technology plays kind of the, the breaking, as a game-changing kind of idea, having black ocean strategies. For example, I had this uh, example about insurance companies and banks and these unique value propositions. There was a big movement 20 years ago called Alfinanz. Yeah? So this was kind of the idea, you know, banks, insurance companies together, and holistically you, you bring all these kind of products and value propositions to the clients. You know? It was not very successful. And I think, you know, it was really the underlying technology was missing, you know, to make it happen. Looking at the time, unfortunately, I have to say we have to stop here. I'm pretty sure Michael is still around afterwards. 
in, a, in the break or for a beer after the event. Um, with this, I suggest we move on into the next streams that all presenters have enough time to present their topics. Thank you very much, Michael, again. Thank, Thank you. you.